Hello, uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces and some new ones too. I'm Louisa, I'm the director of the Light Bulb Trust, and we're really excited to kick off this session around impact investing. Um, the main idea is to talk a little bit about our experience being a family foundation and being one of the handful of small foundations in the UK doing direct impact investing. And we'll also cover some aspects you might want to think about if you are considering it and want to start planning your, your impact investing journey. Uh, in terms of the agenda, um, we'll first hear from Ben Holden, Lightbulb Trust's co-founder and trustee. He will then explain why they decided to start with impact investing from day one, which is very unusual. Um, and then I'll go over some key aspects of impact investing and our experience, a few recommendations, challenges, and I'll be very strict with, with timing myself because I want to make sure we leave at least 20 minutes at the end for questions um, and discussions. So with that, let's hear from Ben now. Ben, over to you. Hi. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you, guys. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, background on Lightbulb, um, which I founded with my wife, Salome, uh, five years ago. Um, we uh, wanted to establish a charitable vehicle for the means that we had, uh, fortunately, at our disposal and put them to good use to change lives for the better. Um, Salome's family have a foundation, but neither of us are professionals from the charity sector. Um, that said, from the get-go, we wanted um, Lightbulb to be proactive. We wanted to be dynamic as much as we could be. We wanted to be ambitious. We are excited. It was a bit of an adventure for us. Um, so we're married with two children growing up in West London. So we decided to drill down as our focus predominantly, primarily, um, literacy, learning, life chances, younger people in West London, uh, peers who perhaps were not as fortunate, privileged as ours. Um, that was the initial focus. And over time, as you'd expect, over five years or so, our remit as a um, charity, as a funder has grown, expanded, evolved. But we do still pride ourselves on our network in West London. Uh, we have a strong nucleus of partners here and um, it remains a big part of what we do, that place-based funding. In terms of being proactive, dynamic, um, accepting bandwidth, budget, et cetera, uh, we thought from the beginning that we would really love to get into social enterprise investment, impact investment. Um, we're not from a finance background either. Um, and although we have some tangential experience of investing, uh, it's not our expertise. So that may have been helpful in the sense of um, us going slightly blindly into this, but with um, a lot of excitement and um, optimism. I think we we wanted to do it because we thought that perhaps by making impact, excuse my camera, it has a life of its own, um, if it's zooming in, um, we thought that uh, impact investments might just allow us um, opportunities to champion change makers who are doing some really disruptive work. So people who are um, finding new, unique uh, models of delivery to enact social change and change lives for the better. Um, that's not to say, obviously, I, I barely um, need to caveat this, but I will. Of course, all our charitable partners are disruptors and are innovative and proactive. But we just thought there might be something um, exciting about finding those change makers who have really bold, excuse the pun, light bulb moments that we could get behind and really uh, catalyze their work. Um, so we set about trying to uh, figure this out. We've learned on the job. And over time, we now, I would say, our ethos as a group um, straddles both impact investments and grants fairly equally. We do see our grants as impact investments. We are making investments in, in impact, in impacting uh, change and people's lives for the better. So we've developed a framework um, and our theory of change, again, runs across everything we do. And I'll let Louisa explain more. Um, and I should say, again, as we've learned on the job, 
we uh, got lucky along the way um, in that uh, principally also that we are working with Louisa. So um, Louisa joined us four years ago and we're very fortunate because she has uh, brilliant expertise and is, is very adept at managing both grants and impact investments. Again, I'm gonna let her talk more to that, but um, by accident, five years on, we find ourselves in a fairly unique position. We sort of stumbled into this a little bit or by accident. Um, and we're fairly unique as a smallish family foundation making these direct investments. We have found it very, very rewarding. We're working with some unbelievably inspirational people um, and doing some really brilliant, brilliant things. Um, so although we, we may have happened into this somewhat unique position, we do hope that it won't always be the case or increasingly this ecosystem will grow of diver and we, you will join us perhaps in this direct investment um, and the opportunities that we've found. If we can do it, you definitely can. Um, so we've got the adventure we wanted and I'm gonna let now uh, Louisa uh, speak more to um, to the uh, nuts and bolts and and how you maybe can, can join us on that journey, Louisa. Thank you so much, Ben. Great, great intro to the thinking behind your your decision as as founders uh, and to the 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 work of light bulbs um, more more generally. Um, I'll try to unpack a little more um, uh, our journey in the next hopefully thirty minutes or less, uh, and we'll hopefully inspire you to start exploring impact investing. Um, before we start, I just wanted to say that this is a very short session. And impact investing is complex, and there are lots of issues that need to be taken into account if you're if you're considering it. So we're happy to organize another session later in the year with more hands-on tools if you're interested, or even from from a, a small investor support group to 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 tackle the issue together. Um, what else? Oh, I'll probably stress it a hundred times during the presentation. Uh, we are not experts; we are learners, and we are learning by doing. So it's been five years since we started. So this is our journey, and I'm sure that it might not be the right strategy for many of you, many of you. But if we help you avoid making a few mistakes, and if we can build on our learnings, I think we'll have uh, met our goals. Um, so let's kick off. So the first slide: What's impact investing uh, or social investing? I think we could easily spend an hour on this question. This is a very and, and I chose this image. You, hopefully, you all, you all can see um, our first slide. It shows the spectrum of capital um, from traditional philanthropy at the bottom on the left. Uh, and I say traditional because we all know that philanthropy has evolved massively. And you go all the way to your traditional investing. And then if you look inside each, each one of those circles, you see all different organizations touched by each of those different ways of financing from traditional nonprofits to traditional businesses and everything in between. In the middle, you can see the little star there uh, is where impact investing lives. And I've added a line around our area of focus, the red, orange, and green organizations. These are all random colors, obviously, just to show how impact investing has allowed us to expand the types of organizations we're able to work with. Um, this is just to, to illustrate or try to illustrate how impact investing can broaden how we make an impact as a funder, as opposed to only doing grant making and focusing on one particular type of organization. And you might ask, why is this relevant? Um, Helen, if you could go to the next slide, please. So a recent research by the Schwab Foundation in the US found that there are approximately 10 million social enterprises globally, which collectively generate around 2 trillion US dollars in revenue each year. And this is a lot of money, much bigger than many, many traditional industries like telcos. Uh, for me personally, what's Equally, or even more striking, is the leadership of these enterprises. Half of them are led by women, compared to only 20% of conventional businesses. So it really shows how inclusivity and diversity are ingrained uh, within these ventures. 
Um, and actually, one, one quick note about the language I use. I think social enterprises are the best way to describe those impact startups, and that's my favorite term. But sometimes I use startups, ventures, or even companies. But, but in the context of this presentation, I think what I really mean is social enterprise, those venture, those, uh, those gener uh, revenue generating ventures uh, with a social mission. So if you could go to the next one, please. So there are many ways you could start doing impact investing. And we're not going through all of them because, well, we don't have enough time. And again, we're not experts. But I wanted to show the different strategies and, and show that there is no one-size-fits-all approach. We decided to invest directly in social enterprises. So it means that we go out and find them. Uh, we carry out our own due diligence. We review legal papers, contracts, everything. We provide ongoing support to founders as much as we can because we're small after the after we complete it, each one of the investments. Um, it's a very unique approach. And Ben mentioned that when when we when he when he spoke, it, because we're probably one of the handful small foundations in the UK doing direct impact investing. As most organizations investing directly in companies are much bigger than we are in terms of team and budget. I, I really looked at them. I, I, we're probably talking about five. Uh, and if you know more, please, please tell me because I'd love to meet them. Um, but obviously, that's not the only way. That's how we do it. In terms of indirect investing, and a disclaimer here, I don't even know if that's a term. I might have made it up. But I found it helpful to separate those two approaches as they are very different. Uh, with this second bucket, there are a lot of things inside of it. Um, and I think the two more common to mention here is investing in a fund. You, you put your money in a fund that is mission aligned and way to see which companies they pick. Or you could be part of a syndicate that will source the deals, do all the due diligence for you, and you can have a say if you want to invest in that company or not. Um, with both options, you, you need to pay a fee. But I think in terms of how much money you need, there is some flexibility there. So we're not necessarily talking millions here. I think there's there's the option of, of starting small. So going back to direct investing, what we do is definitely a heavier lift. But we are convinced that this is the right approach for our organization. And I'll, and I'll share our thinking. Um, we believe in being a partner-centric organization. And we focus a lot of time on building strong relationships with our portfolio of charities, social enterprises, our, our partners in general. We want to know them well. We want to deal with them directly uh, because we feel that this helps us add value beyond the financial support we, we, we give. It could be through making connections to, to, to potential clients if they are, comp if they are a, a company running pilots with them to test new approaches, make introductions, recommendations to other funders or investors, et cetera. We really believe in their mission and we want to be there for them. So, uh, oh, and, and there's a selfish reason that is that we learn a lot from them and they help us to become better funders and we learn more if we're, if we're closer to them. If you could go to the next slide, please. So why we're doing it? Probably the most important question of all. There are many reasons, but for brevity, I'll, I'll cover four. Uh, actually, I might sneak in a fifth one if we have time. Let, let's see um, how I'm doing. Yeah, I'm a little behind, I'm a little behind. Let's see. Learning and disruption, the first one. We want to fund, and Ben mentioned that too, we want to fund new, creative, innovative ways to solve social problems. We love startups learning mindset, uh, and we want to try to, to foster collaboration between the two groups of organizations, startups and nonprofits, as much as we can. We even have a separate uh, fund for that, but that's that's another one hour session to talk about it. Uh, we feel that having startups in our small but vibrant ecosystem really adds, has added value actually over, over the past few years, we've seen that. Um, the second one is sustainability. Uh, and this is, I'm talking about sustainability of the organizations we invest in. We've invested in um, organizations that are working hard to become more financially sustainable through generating some revenue. And generating revenue is actually one of their key metrics. So let's say that a healthy company is already generating enough revenue to support its work and potential growth. This company will carry on having an impact, even if we don't invest in their next round. That's the beauty of it. 
I think the other important thing to have in mind is that you're leveraging market forces, which means that you're pumping capital into the right products and services supporting the planet or, or underserved populations, depending on, on, on your strategy. So if there is a business opportunity there, the market will, will hopefully follow. The third one is scale impact. Successful business solutions scale faster. Our investment, to give you an example, our investment portfolio combined has impacted more than 10 million people globally. This is not about numbers only, and most of your founders, you know that. But if we look at our return on impact, this level of scale would be nearly impossible on the grant making side of our work. So I'm, I'm talking about our, ourselves as, as a small organization with our current budget and our current strategy of being a small place-based funder. And the last one is growth. Um, and I'm talking here about capital growth, uh, potentially having financial returns. This is not our main goal, but if we have our capital back, it could help us drive even more impact through making more investments. And the fifth one I mentioned I would sneak in uh, is that I want to back, we want to back the best social impact leaders. And sometimes this, this is a very important pillar of our theory of change. And sometimes those impact leaders run social enterprises, sometimes they run nonprofits. So being able to offer both impact investments and grants that we can, it really means that we can meet them where they are in their journey. So, because we'll be able to provide the, the most suitable, the best type of financing. If you could go to, to the next one, please. Thank you, Helen. So this is just a simplified version of our impact investment thesis, just to demystify it a little bit because the, the sound of it already, it sounds already very complicated, just, just, just the sound of, of having a thesis. Uh, an impact investment thesis doesn't need to be long or complicated. It needs to be accessible and useful. These are simply the key elements that guide our decision making. You probably have a similar thing anyway for, for grant making. So you probably it will likely include your investment strategy, uh, your impact tools, your process, how you, you choose and how you manage your investments, etc. I think the, one of the key elements uh, I'd love to highlight here is that we are a small foundation, so we prioritize the early stage companies as we don't have a massive budget for investing, uh, because, and the, because they simply because they they tend to raise less capital, and the focus on underrepresented founders that you can see there at the bottom. It wasn't a priority when we started, but it came very naturally, and it was how we evolved. Um, after listening to several entrepreneurs pitched to us we decided to start focusing on diverse founders. Uh, ideally, with lived experience of the problems they, they, they are solving because it felt right and aligned with our general theory of change. Uh, now, do you need an investment thesis to start investing? No, you don't. You could start with some areas you want to explore, you're curious about, that is aligned with overall strategy, uh, small budget, and start investing. The criteria will become sharper, hopefully, as you progress. It did, it did, it did happen um, to us. Uh, today, I find helpful to have um, our investment criteria in writing on our website. We, we, we are clear on our investment goals. We can measure learnings. We can communicate our value proposition very clearly to founders and potential partners. But another thing to highlight is that we only worked on our thesis last year. So the thesis is actually a summary of our learnings from the previous four years. So... I think the learning here is don't feel that you need to have all figure out to be able to start investing. We made one investment in the first year and two in the second year. So one approach could be start small, deploy some capital and learn from, from the experience. You could go to the next one, please. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. It's just some, some of our operational stats. What I really love to, I would really love to highlight um, the first point. All 11 investments we made so far are still standing or alive. And it's the reason it's outstanding is because it's said that 90% of startups fail in the first five years. And at least half of our portfolio are beyond their fifth year and nowhere near dying, touch wood. So this is very unusual and we'll probably need more time and a bigger sample to drive conclusions. But my hypothesis is that last stat at the bottom. The fact that the vast majority of our founders come from underrepresented backgrounds, and many of them have lived experience of the problems they are solving, is likely making a huge difference in our success rate. 
I think it might be our portfolio secret sauce. Not, not to mention that this is this is by far the, the, the right thing to do. Um, if you could go to the next one, please. So yeah, so just to give some color to all the all the all the talking, uh, these are just two examples of companies led by brilliant women that have invested um, recently. Uh, and so you can see also how it fits on, under our uh, our criteria priorities uh, and some of the things we're focusing, we've been focusing on. The first one is speak. Uh, very quickly, do you know what is the second most Googled question by parents of teenagers? Why do teens cut themselves? I think it's, I think it's, well, I'm just back from a time to leave, so I'm, I'm very emotional about these things, so... Speak is a very necessary platform that offers support, tools, and community to parents of teens who self-harm. And it falls very well under our mental health and well-being pillar. The second one, I don't know if we have Claudine joining, because I can't see all of you. I'm here. Ah, Claudine is here. So, Claudine, uh, I'm not going to explain what it is, as I'm seeing uh, Claudine is, has joined us. So... I'll let her explain a little bit about the company. Claudine, your, your elevator pitch in your experience as a founder, it would be brilliant in three minutes. <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go really quickly. Over um, to you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, Claudine here, uh, founder and CEO of Early Bird. Um, so we build software to help organizations to better engage with um, lower income and frontline workers. Um, today, we work really closely with employment support organizations. Um, so these are organizations that use billions of pounds of um, uh, public funds to deliver like, welfare to work style programs. Um, so that involves hyper personalized uh, one to one uh, support for each participant. Unfortunately, a lot of the um, the way that it works is you kind of use employment advisors and they get really, really bogged down with administrative tasks and struggle to deliver the positive outcomes um, that they need to at scale. And so we exist to help them uh, be more efficient. Um, so we use AI and voice technology to enable their participants to have conversations um, in which they can share their interests, their challenges, support areas without their advisor's input at that stage. And then we deliver reporting to their advisor, equipping them with really rich insights and recommendations so that they can focus on delivering high quality support at scale um, to their program uh, participants. And that support ranges from helping them to overcome housing challenges to mental health challenges or kind of lack of skills and, and kind of pure employability work. Um, and the ultimate idea is that they're then able to support those individuals to access work or in some cases better paid work uh, much faster. Um, in terms of um, uh, being a founder and, and raising investment, so we're nearing the end of our fundraising journey to raise half a million pounds um, to take our product to the next level and scale to half a million pounds of revenue. Um, but it's, I'm sure you've heard, very hard as an underrepresented founder. I basically tick a lot of the boxes that exclude me from raising from typical investors who generally require a warm introduction from someone they know well, which basically means that you have to be similar to them, which means you have to be white, middle class, privately educated and from a pri privileged background, which I'm none of those things. Um, and then I think from my experience, what I found in impact investing um, because we've been really, really keen to make sure that we have investors on board that really get that we're impact first rather than the typical kind of high growth startup, um, which is growth at all costs and, and don't really care about um, delivering the social benefit as well as the economic benefit. Um, I find that the odds are then stacked against you even more because they're, it's a, quite a niche area. So fewer investors, um, fewer that go early um, like White Bob do. Um, and I just think, yeah, without without more stepping up, um, it's really going to be a struggle to build um, a high volume of successful impact first startups um, that do deliver that economic and social benefit, because you just need that diversity um, to create the change that we that we really want to see in the world. So I love that this is happening, love that this conversation is happening, would love to see more investors, more innovation from existing investors like what Lightbulb have done um, and, and just support, I think, for underrepresented founders to actually access the seed capital that they need at the earliest stages so yeah that's that's pretty much me happy to chat offline um with anyone who is actively investing because we have a small allocation left if you're interested um but i will hand back over to louisa thank you brilliant uh 
you've heard her. She's raising. So please do get in touch if you if you want to work together, if you want to invest, if you want to work with this brilliant person, founder, and organization. So Flodin, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and privilege to, to have you and Early Bird as part of our of our portfolio. So um, if you could go to the next one, please, Helen. So I've selected a few challenges. There are many, like with grant making, um, because impact investing is great, but it's not easy. So these are some of the key things we learned that, that we feel it might be helpful um, to some of you, of you. First one is attack is hard. We fund learning and education on the grant making side. So we thought, well, so most of our investment will probably be in ed tech, right? No, none of them. The business model is challenging because selling to schools is hard. So we pivoted and ex expanded our, our, our remit to make sure we could still have an impact around the areas we focus. Uh, we focus on that is learning, employability, and mental health. Um, so the, the lesson there is be flexible and go where, where the energy is. Second one, place-based funders. Um, the second one is that impact investing might be very hard for place-based funders like us. We focus on grant making in West London, but we had to flex on geography to make sure we could have access to the most impactful social enterprises. So we are now investing across the UK, grant making still focusing on West London, um, but we feel that it was worth it as many of the solutions uh, we invested in would be replicated in, in West London. Um, the, the next one is monitoring and evaluation. It has been a challenging, it has been a challenge because we are a small investor, so we don't normally decide the investment conditions. So I feel that last year we, we kind of nailed impact monitoring on the grant making side, but it, it needs more work on the investment side. Having said that, I think we got better, and I think this is key, we got better at spotting great, great founders like Claudine who are naturally more open and collaborative and willing to share more, more information with us. Timing. Timing is everything in impact investing. So it might be hard for a grant maker to understand that even if you find this brilliant social enterprise that is the perfect fit and you want to work together with them, you cannot invest because they're not raising. You might not be able to invest if they're not raising. So there is a bit of a learning curve there for, for grant makers. Uh, due diligence and legal, I've added that one just to stress again. It's not easy and it, it's time consuming if you're doing it on your own like we're doing. But it's not impossible, as I normally do our due diligence, but it's worth considering finding some support there, either legal support or pro bono or an expert volunteer. Um, and I'll talk a little, a little bit more about it in our, in, in our next slide. Um, and the last one, again, to stress again that it's high risk, slow return. Uh, it's high risk, especially for those investors who are expecting a return that may never happen. For us, um, the majority of the companies we invested in, if they keep growing and impacting people, will be happy about the outcome. So that's not a bad scenario for us. Now, if we could have our capital back or even have some profit, even better, and we would be able to reinvest and create even more um, impact. So impact investing is called patient capital for this reason. So it might take several years, year, several years until you can exit an investment if you can. So it's not always possible to recover your capital. Um, so I think we will need to be clear um, about the risks. So next one, please. So with everything we said, do we really, really feel that it's for smaller funders? We do. And I highlighted four key things to consider before you start. The team. Our team is me, part-time. Two brilliant trustees with relevant experience. One is a lawyer, uh, so we have legal, and then the other one, finance, has, has been doing impact investing for ages. And we have one high-skilled volunteer, a very experienced uh, investor. So there are ways you could have all the support you need without or most, the, the most, of, most support you need, you might need without having to hire several people and, and several expensive consultants. Um, so yeah, have, I think having trustees with relevant backgrounds in, our, in your board is, is key. Uh, I think another option could be reskilling your grant managers. And you, I think you would be surprised if you, about how much of the conversation 
with founders is about impact rather than financial KPIs and how much value your grant managers can add based on the experience dealing with great nonprofits. And on top of it, you can add the extra layers of support with trustees, pro bono legal advice, high-skilled volunteers, et cetera. So there are creative ways you could minimize costs there. Um, second one is budget. 100% up to you. We did one investment in the first year. I mentioned that before. That was £20,000. Uh, you could even make one investment of £5,000 and grow from there. You really don't need a massive budget to get started. Um, and legal support, I have added it again at the bottom. So we're very lucky to have a very hands-on and committed trustee who's also a lawyer, but I couldn't stress it hard enough how important it is to have access to good legal advice. Um, for, each, for each of the deals you'll be assessing, but also to understand the impact investing legal framework, specific things the Charity Commission wants you to consider. If you search, if you go to the Charity Commission website and search uh, for social investments, there are some 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 helpful guidelines there. It's, it's a good place to start. And the last one is portfolio. That's the question I get asked all the time. How do you find your founders? We find investments through other investors mission-driven accelerators or incubators, inbound requests from founders, et cetera, et cetera. It really varies. Uh, it's not easy, but it, it gets easier over time. More people will get to know you and you will hopefully build a reputation as an investor and will it will po positively impact your deal flow. That is the ongoing stream of great companies you will eventually have access to. Um, and I think that's a good transition to my last slide. So the, the logo soup, this is just to show that we are definitely not alone. So there are, there are great incubators or accelerators, the first line there, that you could go to find great companies if you decide to invest directly. So I'm always emailing them, say, say what, what, what's happening? And I'm following events, I'm joining events. They, they know me and, and actually by now they all know me and they keep sending me people because they know our investment thesis and they think, oh, we think it's a good, it's a good fit for you. Uh, in the second line, there are a few organizations that might be able to help you if you decide that you don't want to do it on your own, like funds and syndicates. There are some very good ones there. And I recommend you have a look at May's, uh, May's um, impact report. It's really great the way they're measuring um, their impact. And, and lastly, there are some uh, great consultancies if you feel that it's worth doing some work on your investment thesis and criteria before starting um, and I haven't even added like some frameworks, uh, the research uh, organizations like Ezade in Spain or Jean. So it's the ecosystem is is vast. So we are we are not alone. Um, so I'm happy to share contacts and make introductions to any of these organizations if helpful. I think I know most of them. Maybe one or two that that I haven't connected yet. Um, and I'm also happy to share the the presentation. Just reach out to us. I think my contact is in the last slide. Great. Yeah. There's our web website, Twitter, my email. So yeah, I really um I really love this stuff. So happy to have a chat with anyone who has questions or wants to start and don't know how. And I hope I inspired, we inspired you to get investing and not the other way around. We didn't hopefully you didn't, you, you we didn't scare you away. So yeah, I would love to hear your comments, feedbacks, or questions, if any. Thanks so much, Louisa, um, and to Ben as well, and Claudine as well. Really great that you could um, also join and bring that all, help bring it all to life. So really great to hear from you all. Um, I will wait for hopefully some yellow hands or if people want to come off mute um, to ask any questions or kind of reflections or indeed kind of share your own um, experiences of um, um, of doing uh, impact investing. Jem, uh, do you want to come in? Hi, Louisa. Thank you. That was Hi, really Jim. interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious how you manage the, because my understanding is you invest in for-profit structures right for the most part i was wondering how you then manage the um sort of charity commission guidance around private gain and mm -hmm. yeah the issue some of the issues that can arise around that yeah that's that's a good question Jem. 
uh, they are for profits, but we spend a lot of time on their due diligence, a lot of time. And, and I'm happy to share our due diligence structure with all of you. And the key thing we need to show in that due diligence is that there is a very strong social impact mission that is aligned with our objects, that is helping underserved populations in the UK uh, through learning, education, mental health. Uh, so it really has to be aligned with our objects. Um, many of the companies, we, it's not a requirement from us, but many of the companies we invest, they have a mission lock in their articles anyway. But even those who that doesn't have a mission lock, the product is so mission aligned. They're really focusing on helping, for example, upskill and train homeless people and place them into jobs that it couldn't be more mission aligned with what we do. So we are very careful to choose those companies and also be really, really thoughtful and thorough with the due diligence. So in case anyone comes to us, charity commission comes knocking and said, okay, let me see, let me see your papers. Said, oh yeah, we have, we have tons of things to, to share. And the downside, it's time consuming. Is a heavy lift, as you know, because you've you've done many due diligence. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll recommend you check the guidelines. They're getting better. When we started, it was hard. I didn't understand them. It was vague, and and they're they're improving because it's 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 a learning. I think it's a learning process. It's a learning journey for the charity commission too. Thanks, Louisa. Uh, Emily. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. That was super useful. Um, I have many questions, so I'll, I'll try and articulate them. Um, so I work for Camden Council where we're working on a participatory investment fund at the moment. Um, one of the things that struck me is that you said you wanted to initially kind of have a place-based kind of fund invest in West London and then you said you kind of had to expand to the whole of the UK I imagine because of the amount of maybe applications that you receive so I'd love to hear kind of why yeah. um, one of the other things that I'm really interested in is how much support you're kind of like having or like how much of investment you have to do in kind of like supporting uh, the people that you kind of invest in to kind of like just like the sort of like I don't know like the side where you're kind of uh, supporting people with uh, starting up businesses and stuff like that yeah. uh, or if you're kind of like and what's your approach with it like do you do everything kind of internally or do you work with incubators and other kind yeah. of um, people and I think I'll leave it there because I just have so many things in my head, but these are the most important ones. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks. These are great questions. Uh, it, well, it's it's questions we talk about on a daily basis, basically. Um, so we, the, I'll tackle the, the place-based one first. So we are still a place-based funder on the grant making side. So we still have this very strong focus on West London. On the investment side, we started being more flexible, I think for two reasons. To have, an, to have access to a wider and bigger pool of great companies. Because obviously, if you're looking to uh, four or five borrows in London, you're going to access have access to fewer social enterprise rather than if you're looking um, across the UK. And also because we always go for, I think not always, but I think in, in many cases, we go for highly scalable solutions. And very likely these solutions are tech-based. So it doesn't really matter if they're in West London because they can be, their solutions can be replicated in West London. And we have something that we call the integration challenge. There is a separate pot of funding. I mentioned that in my presentation to fund integrations between for-profits and non-profits or, or to non-profits. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we're hoping to actually bring some of those uh, new solutions to our, our area of focus uh, in terms of geography. Uh, so that's the first question. The second one you're asking about the in-kind support we do after we invest, right? Um, it's less than I would like to because we're very small. And so there's some, there are two things. There's like a more structured way of supporting them that offering integration challenge possibility. We have a few relationships with pro bono advisors on, on impact, measure, impact measurement, data and analysis, uh, fundraising so we have those relationships uh, and there is like the 
unstructured side that is basically founders call us and say, look, I am, uh, I don't know, I'm looking, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a, a head of product. Do you know anyone? And then we go, we go out and ask and try to connect them with our networks. Um, so there are like, we do both things, uh, but we really let, we, we kind of, we try to let founders lead the relationship as much as we can because they're, bu they're busy building a company. So we're not knocking every month said, can, can we have a monthly call? So no, it's building that relationship. You know where to find us. Please come when you when you need us. Um, and and over time, it gets it gets easier to add value when you when you know more about the company. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm also thinking if you have anything before the application stage in terms of like building pipelines or like that are kind of. Um, representing like the the sort of like marginalized communities that you're kind of trying to invest in for example or like you know not not just kind of once you've made your investment decisions but also kind of before to make sure that you also are kind of encouraging maybe people who haven't created their business to do so as well or is that not just not part of what you're doing yeah and I understand what you're asking I think we have a few things like that on our grant making side, there's a few partners on the ground, very entrepreneurial, working with young people in West London, in our area of focus. We do have that on the on the on the grant making side, uh, but yeah, not on the on the on the impact investing side. But that's a very good, great suggest suggestion. I, I would love to say actually, that's a great idea. We should do it. Uh, but yeah, not yet. But on the grant making side, we do have a few partners um, that are kind of focusing on on entrepreneurship and young people. Great, thanks so much. Thanks, Thank Anthony. you. Uh, James, what's going Hi there. Um, I think you probably just answered the question, but I'll I'll ask it anyway. Um, uh, we're a we're a grant maker um, across the UK, and um, I just wondered um, how you compared your relationship as a grant maker with your relationship with your investees. Um, and, and how that compared and whether you needed to adapt your processes and procedures and or whether it's relatively seamless. Um, how, do, how do you find that? The, yeah, I love I love that question. Uh, thank you, James. Um, that's I, I find it really interesting. Um, I don't know if Ben has the same feeling, but um, my relationship with them is very similar, and I'm normally the main point of contact for both sides. One thing that I notice is that I learned a lot from doing due diligence and hearing social entrepreneurs pitching, that it actually impacted and changed the way I do due diligence and interact with our chari charity partners as well. Um, and I think I became a better funder, a better grant maker because of impact investments. So, for example, when I'm having a call with one of our grantees and we're talking about a project we funded and, and the challenge and, and or, or they are explaining what they do, I'm, I'm, I spend more time actually trying to understand what, what is, is her pain point in terms of CEO? How is the team? Is there a lot of people burning out? Uh, the governance, are the trustees right for them? I'm, I'm way more interested in in the organizational capacity rather than on the, that project on the ground, because I know they are, they, are, they are experts. I know they deliver impact and that's why they're part of the portfolio. I know that, but I want to make sure that the CEO is not burning out, that they not, they don't have like a high staff turnover. All those questions that you would ask a startup, but and then with grants, with, when we're grant makers and sometimes we, we just obsess too much about that specific workshop they're delivering on the ground rather than, but what if, what if the CEO burns out? Maybe maybe the CEO needs a, a, a COO, a head of, right, a chief of staff, and, 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 and she hasn't realized it. Um, so it actually has impacted a lot. But in general today, I think it's it's actually very similar Um the our our relations. I don't know if Ben, if you want to add uh, anything to that. I mean, I think that's a pretty thorough, um, great answer, um, Louisa. I would uh, second everything you said, and like I said at the top, uh, I think you know our ethos in terms of building a network support that we offer, as Louisa's talking about capacity. Um, those conversations do 
dovetail. We have this integration scheme and, you know, we'd love for our investees to work with our grantees. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think it's it's quite fluid. And as Louise is saying, it's informed our approaches on, on both sides, actually how we approach um the founders of the of the investment vehicles but also the uh the enterprises but also the the charities so good answer louisa thanks ben uh sarah yep hi thanks louisa that was um so interesting and useful to touch on the place-based um issue as well because we're just we're just a Southwark funder and um, and I think there may be some limitations, but what I'm finding is we're increasingly funding organisations with core and unrestricted funding, and it seems like there's almost a, a relatively easy shift into into um, impact investing from from having made that step. I just wonder whether you've got um, have you developed any kind of framework for and is it available for assessing whether a business is a good bet. I mean, how mm -hmm. how to what extent do you do you get that scientific about it, or how much is it kind of gut feel? I know I know with small entrepreneurs, it's often you just have a sense of how of yeah. you know, of someone's potential, and and a lot of what I'm doing is increasingly, in it's instinct, isn't it? And I think that's yeah. what happens. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit of both science and instinct. Um, we we did uh, so we when we did our investment thesis or the work um, uh, with our investment thesis last year, we also kind of looked into our due diligence process uh, and made it more science <laughs> than hard. Uh, so now we have a scorecard that we looked at. We look at many things from uh, the organizational structure through the market, is this a highly compact, competitive market? There is no way they'll be able to generate any, any revenue through all the way through, does the founder has lived experience, is a diverse founder, so we do have a scorecard and with actual numbers that we put across uh, different uh, different um, areas. Uh, and I'm happy to, to share that with you if if helpful. Uh, but also there's us, the, the heart side of things that is after you speak with so many founders, you end up being becoming very very good at spotting great ones like Claudine, uh, who are the right fit for your organization. Um, who are they know their stuff because mainly because they have lived experience, they experience the problem they're they're solving. They're there for the long haul. It's not to make an exit and sell to a large company that will make profit and then uh, there won't be any impact. Uh, so I think that's the hard side of things as well that I think is also very important. But yeah, the short answer, yes, we do. We do have a scorecard and, and we, we do a pre-assessment and then a longer one before we invest. I, I would just add, um, uh, although that may not be on our website, we've we've published our frameworks and we're very transparent and open, as Louise has already um, mentioned. Um, so do please check out the website because there's there's a... There's a more expansive um, uh, set of graphic graphics there, infographics, whatever. It's all laid out there. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, I'm sure we'll be taking you up on that, um, that very generous offer. Um, are there any more questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, Nadine. Hiya, um, thank you, Louisa and Ben for um, the presentation. I just had a quick question. I think you've sort of touched on it, but um, we're also um, interested in supporting underrepresented sort of founders and CEOs. And um, one of the sort of conversations we keep entering is that actually quite a number of them would like a period of grants um, instead of investment, whilst they sort of prove concept. And um, I was wondering how much much time you spend with them discussing if they're investment ready and which is the right type of funding and would you offer both to mm. that type of organization it's a good question Nadine um we we normally start having conversations with those social entrepreneurs because they're raising very likely well sometimes I get to I reach out to great companies that I don't know if you're raising but I'd love to learn more about your work and maybe they are not um, so normally we don't make grants to our investments, 
Having said that, we've done that during COVID because, because it was the right thing to do. Um, so, but but the I, I would say 95% of the cases we, we have conversations about investment and not about grants. Um, but I know it's possible. I know big funders like um, uh, big uh, big lottery funds. They they've made grants to to investment, especially if if those sorry they make grants to companies to for profits, especially if they have like a mission lock in the article. So that's possible. So it's not it's something that the the charity commission allows. Uh, but that's not what we do. So we normally invest, and then on the grant making side, we we normally deal with the non-profits and the for-profits, we do investments, but we kind of look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. We, we try to introduce a few grants to investments and we it's early days for us. We're still having, like trying to talk to lawyers and having legal advice to see if that's possible and how we can make sure uh, is the right thing to do. But today, I think the only grant available will be the integration challenge. That is an integration between for-profits and non-profits. -non yeah, no, thank you. That's interesting. Just start, having spoken to a few startups, it's sometimes they're forced to say that they're raising because they can't access any other sort of grant funding or it's incredibly hard to raise yep. sort of funding to get started. So they say they're raising, but actually they're not, not always necessarily investment ready. Um, yeah. It's really, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah no, as, well as we normally work with uh, all those accelerators and incubators, once they leave, they start raising. And then I normally like get those recommendations when they have like a, an open round, normally a seed or pre-seed round. Um, so right. it's, it's actually when we get in, when we get in as, as an investor. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Louisa. Thanks, Nadine. Um, Radhika, I think a thing popped up. Yes, do you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to respond to that. So I'm from Impact Eleven Health, um, and this is not necessarily my area of expertise, which is why I've joined this call. But we have what uh, we um, uh, did have done social investment to some of our grant fund gr grantee partners. So to social enterprises, uh, 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 black led. Uh, organizations who were providing the sorts of services that we want to buy. So research organizations and um, design organizations and that, that the kind of, so to where we were fairly confident that we, there will be business coming their way uh, from us and from others. Uh, we did, so, so we did it the other way around with there, there were grantee partners and we also did some social investments into them. Thanks, Radhika. That's really helpful to hear as well. Um, we are about out of time. So that's beautifully uh, on time from presenters and for all your questions. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to ask it, but I know, Louise, you've offered your email. So if you do want to follow up, um, of course, please um, do so. Um, I know a few people have dropped off already, but lots of thanks going on in the chat, which I will yeah reiterate um, to you all. So Louisa and Ben and Claudine, who I know has um, disappeared to get to her next um, next meeting. Um, really, really helpful. And I think the honesty and kind of how uh, you've sort of shared the learning process for you as a, as a small funder, um, yeah, has certainly sort of brought a lot of those insights to life as well as the actual how how you go about doing it so a real a really good uh, helpful session um so yeah on behalf of London funders thanks so much and to you all for coming um we will wrap up now but as I said do check out the rest of the program it'd be great to see you all again and hopefully we can pick up another conversation on impact investing um soon it's certainly something yeah we're really keen to to learn more about ourselves and also uh, within our wider membership. So thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.